FSU's continued rise would hit a plateau in 1959 as Perry Moss became the Seminoles' fourth head coach. Already an assistant at five previous schools, Moss arrived in Tallahassee amidst high hopes and great expectations. But following a four and six campaign and a huge contract offer from the Montreal Alouettes of the Canadian Football League, he left Florida State after only one season. His departure prompted FSU to hire a separate athletic director, Vaughn Mancha. The new head coach, Bill Peterson, would come from LSU. In 1960, Bill Peterson brought a flashy passing game to Tallahassee and an 11-year reign of success. Just three games into his first season, speculation among state writers was that Florida State would never be able to keep Peterson for any length of time. How wrong they were. In fact, by the end of his term, the whole nation would hear of FSU. In his final five years, FSU threw the ball more consistently and effectively than any other team in the nation. Coach Peterson was fantastic if you're a wide receiver. If you were running back, he wasn't the best to play for. <laughs> and since I was a wide receiver, he was great because we, uh, we had uh, an exciting game plan almost every game. Uh, we were going to move the football around. Peterson's style and philosophy helped prepare his assistants for future success at many levels. Among the coaches in Peterson's pipeline were Don James, Gene McDowell, Dan Henning, Joe Gibbs, Bill Parcells, and Bobby Bowden. But coach Bill Peterson would bring to Florida State something besides a fancy passing game, Petersonisms. Coach Pete had a wonderful way of putting the English language in a verbal blender and then turning out phrases at full speed ahead. Eddie Feely uh, used to give the little prayer before, before we went out on the field, before a game. And, uh, you know, Coach Pete said one time, he said, you know, Eddie, I'll take over the place. So, you know, as I lay me down to sleep, and he goes, Feely, Feely, take over, take over, you know. Or we were going in, the, in a, in a four-plane four engine and that type of deal on our trips. But that was just Pete, you know, that was just Bill. And, he, you know, his mind was always ahead, you know, all, always a step ahead of himself, you know. So uh, little things that he always did, you know, we just kind of laughed and just let go. But one thing was obvious following the 60 season. The rapid turnover of the previous two years had left FSU with a lack of solid players. Recruiting intensified, and some great names would soon grace the campus. Fred Bolitnikoff played split end at Florida State from 1961 to 64 under head coach Bill Peterson. He simply defined the role of receiver before it was ever called receiver. Bolitnikoff became FSU's first consensus All-American and as a senior ranked fourth in the nation with 57 receptions for 11 touchdowns, plus an amazing four more scores in the Seminoles' 36-19 Gator Bowl victory over Oklahoma. I love football. I love being a receiver. You know, I love being involved in a passing game. I, I you know, at the time, you don't realize uh, with the coaching staff how much they push you and push you and push you, you know, to get the best out of you. Bolitnikov's career was capped with induction to both the college and pro football halls of fame. Combining great hands with football savvy and tireless work habits, Bolitnikov became Florida State's first great professional star. In only their fourth attempt against the University of Florida, the Seminoles would grab the biggest moral victory in school history. In a game that Gator head coach Ray Greaves would liken to a death in the family, FSU battled to a 3-3 tie. The two touchdown favorite Gators were held in check by an impressive Florida State defensive effort. Roy Bickford, the game's MVP, would grab two interceptions and block a punt to set up FSU's lone score. Action after the game was just as intense. 
FSU fans charged the field and attempted to tear down the goalposts. UF fans, trying to protect their home field, guarded them as a wild 30-minute melee erupted. Clearly, the Gators' dominance was on shaky ground. The 1962 season offered a prime example of how tough it was early on for the Seminoles to schedule opponents on a fair basis. With only four games slated for the friendly confines of Doe Campbell Stadium, this squad would have to be a gritty bunch just to survive. And gritty they were. The Georgia Bulldogs, with their top 10 ranked offense and defense, and a vengeful attitude, sought to spoil FSU's hot start in Athens amid increased speculation that Florida State wished to join the Southeastern Conference. FSU would tally five interceptions on this day and begin to take its place among the big time programs of the South. The Big Road victory also started another Seminole tradition. In 1962, Seminole football captains returned home with a piece of sod from Sanford Stadium as a trophy from Florida State's 18 to nothing victory over the University of Georgia. It was presented to Dean Coyle E. Moore, who then founded the tradition of the Sod Cemetery. The treasured turf was buried in the corner of FSU's practice field, and a monument was placed to commemorate the road victory. Sod games represent difficult battles, away from home, against the crowd, against all odds. In the most trying of circumstances, some of the most courageous victories have been achieved. The highlight of the 1963 season was an early humbling of a highly touted Miami team led by George Myra, 24 to nothing. The seeds of change were planted during 1963. However, those fruits would not totally ripen until 1964. The key to success would be a combination Seminole faithful would revere for years to come. Steve Tensey and Fred Bolitnikov. They comprised a feared passing attack that attracted the national spotlight to Tallahassee for the first time. Well, back in those days, the pros and the colleges were four lot yards in a cloud of dust. So we started building a, a passing game. And uh, finally, when we got the right personnel, in Tensi and, and Blood and Pop, it was like steel. Really. Their passing perfection remains the standard many Seminole fans measure by. But looking back on that bright 64 season, it was a group of rugged defenders who got FSU off on the right foot. While the Florida State offense slowly developed in 1964, one of the most famed defensive units in school history took center stage. Their symbol, the shaved head, was a takeoff from the movie The Magnificent Seven, in emulation of star Ewell Brenner. The unit, coached primarily by Bob Harbison, consisted of the front seven, George D'Alessandro, Avery Sumner, Jack Schinholzer, Frank Penny, Max Wettstein, Bill McDowell, and Dick Herman. One of them sneaked up behind me with a razor, and all I saw was all my hair falling over into my lap. And I said, go ahead, let's do it. They wanted to make a commitment. Cut all that hair off, and let's be the magnificent seven. Let's be a bunch of bald-headed guys, but let's have that camaraderie, that bond. We'll, we won't let our hair grow. We're going to go out there and be a formidable foe. The defensive front received so much acclaim that the defensive backs would later dub themselves the Forgotten Four. As a testimonial to their effectiveness, the Seven Magnificents and Forgotten Four allowed only 66 points the entire season and recorded four shutouts. They finished as the nation's third-ranked rushing defense and fifth in total defense. The 64 season opened on a splendid note 
as Fred Bolitnikov's nine catches for 165 yards and two TDs led FSU to a 14 to nothing shutout of the Miami Hurricanes. The Seminoles were off to a good start, but they would have to slay a bigger foe if they were to gain national respect. Kentucky brought that opportunity to Tallahassee for a homecoming affair. The Wildcats, undefeated and ranked fifth nationally after victories over Auburn and number one Old Miss, were no typical homecoming clown. But the tribe made them look like one. In a landmark victory for FSU, one labeled among the biggest upsets of all time according to the Dunkel Index, FSU blasted Kentucky 48 to 6. With the victory, FSU jumped to number 10 in the AP poll, their first ranking ever. On November 21st, 1964, the atmosphere was electric. The moment had finally arrived. The Gators came to Tallahassee for the first time ever. This game would never have taken place in Campbell Stadium without the dedication of Vaughn Mancha and Dean Mode Stone. We decided with Dean Moore, Dean Stone and myself, we would go to Gainesville, meet with our vice president and their athletic board chairman and Ray Graves to see if we can't work this dilemma out about a home and home. Dean Stone, after about an hour and a half or two hours of coffee drinking and arguing about across the table, Dean Moore reached over and said, Mr. Graves, how many seats will it take you to get you to get Tallahassee two years from now? <clears throat> Ray Ray said, well, <clears throat> well, Vaughn, I, I tell you, I think it'd take at least 40, 45,000 seats. Dean Moore jumped up, put his hand across the table, said, all right, you got it. Motivation, as if the tribe needed any, was provided when the Gators practiced all week long in jerseys with the inscription, never, FSU, never. On game day, UF swaggered onto the field with jerseys reading, go for seven, as in their seventh straight victory over the Seminoles. Big mistake. The game they went in there and they said, never, FSU, never, you'll never beat us. The little brother had grown up, and they knew it. Following a Florida State fumble, the Gators looked to capitalize early. But with their backs against the wall, the Seminole defense stood proud like so many times that season. Jack Schinholzer forced a fumble. George DeLisandro recovered to set the tone for the entire day. In the second half, Bolitnikov sailed past two Florida defenders and was wide open for a 55-yard TD reception. Untouched and undaunted, Fred jumped into the end zone for the score. Florida Reserve quarterback Steve Spurrier would later try to salvage a comeback, but to no avail. FSU would win this one 16-7. Coupled with the earlier victory over Miami, the victory garnered Florida State its first state championship. We were expected to lose. You know, nobody expected us to beat them. And we went out there and we were just physical with them. The win also helped FSU secure a major bowl bid in just the 18th year of the Seminole program. The Gator Bowl would be a matchup of striking contrasts. Oklahoma with its powerful running game against Florida State with its dazzling passing attack. The winningest team over the past 18 years versus the newest team to crash the national rankings. We went down there and all oh, the awesomeness of Oklahoma. They had everybody was an All-American at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. And here again, we, were, we might have been a little bit intimidated, but then again, we knew we were good. I don't think we even knew what, what tradition was, you know, and we played a lot of teams with a lot of, with a lot of tradition that year, including the Gator Bowl team, uh, Oklahoma, that, you know, it didn't make any difference to us. We didn't know. The Seminoles would kick tradition in the head while posting some memorable numbers. Tensi, 23 of 36, 303 yards and five touchdowns. Bolitnikov. 13 receptions, 191 yards, and four touchdowns. Together, the dynamic duo set seven Gator Bowl records, 
and were named co-MVPs of the contest. Offensively, Oklahoma had, you know, being in that conference that they were in, they never played against a passing team. All of a sudden, they had to play against somebody that's throwing a ball 30 or 40 times a game, and they just were never ready for it, you know. And so we just went out there and just took the game to them, throwing. FSU crushed Oklahoma 36-19 in a game not as close as the score might indicate. FSU finished that 64 season with a 9-1-1 record, a number 10 national ranking, and 34 new school records. We were just a bunch of guys that wanted to play football, loved football. We came down here uh, involved in a program that was kind of a growing program. So we, all of a sudden, we pop up in collegiate football, we got a heck of a team. You know, and all of a sudden we're setting records, we're beating this team, we beat Florida, we're going to the Gator Bowl, we beat Oklahoma, that type of thing. And all of a sudden we, we get to be part of Florida State history. They thought they could beat anybody, you know, there was just no question about that. They, uh, they had confidence and they worked hard. FSU's fourth straight victory over Georgia highlighted the 1965 season which also produced the school's first 100-yard touchdown play. T.K. Weatherall, who later became a key member of the Florida legislature, took a Bill Mormon lateral on a kickoff versus Kentucky and sprinted for a score that still stands in the FSU record book. In 1966, FSU went 6-5, with four losses to teams ranked in the AP poll. None would sting worse than the defeat to the Gators on a certain, still controversial play. A 6'5 junior wide receiver, Lane Fenner, will be remembered in Florida State lore for a catch that didn't count. In the 1966 clash with the Florida Gators, with UF leading 22-19 and only 28 seconds left, FSU faced second and 10 from the Gators' 45. When star receiver Ron Sellers was shaken up, Fenner came in for his first play of the game. His first play of the season, in fact. On a post pattern which Fenner turned to the outside, Quarterback Gary Padgett rolled right and heaved the ball into the end zone, where Fenner appeared to grab the game-winning touchdown. However, to the tribe's dismay, official Doug Mosley ruled that Fenner was out of bounds and the pass incomplete. So apparent was the TD that FSU passed pictures around following the game as proof of the catch. I can remember Lane catching the ball without a doubt, no question at all and the ref was running down the sideline, signaling touchdown. And he got down there and there were one or two Gator players that were signaling that he was out of bounds. And by the time he had gotten there, he had changed his mind and said he was out of bounds. 1967 was similar to many previous ones at Florida State. The Seminoles' oldest and most persistent concern was depth. But two games against traditional power showed that depth was not always needed on a team stocked with heart and determination. Following the tribe's season opening loss to the Houston Cougars, Alabama awaited in Birmingham, defending national champions and winners of 21 consecutive contests. Pete was trying to get us fired up and uh, he made some comments to the fact that they were no different than we were. I mean, they had two arms, two legs. They put their pants on the same way we did, one leg at a time. Three touchdown underdogs were the Seminoles in a game that was to be televised as part of an ABC Sports documentary on legendary Alabama coach Bear Bryant. Fulfilling an impossible dream, FSU pulled off an amazing 37-37 tie to shock the football world. The 37 points were more than the Crimson Tide defense had given up the entire previous year. Kim Hammond and Sellers put on a, an exhibition of football that you'd never see before. That's one of the most interesting games that I've coached and was, uh, was surrounded by. The documentary would begin with a startled bear 
bellowing on the sidelines just after FSU's Walt Sumner returned to punt for a touchdown. What's going on out there? What the hell's going on out there? Bryant called FSU the best prepared team he had ever played. Ron Sellers led the Seminole offense with 13 receptions, and the Tribe, 0-1-1 following the contest, were ranked 18th the next week. Coach Bryant jokingly came up to me and says, are you Ron Sellers? I said, yes, sir. Yes, coach. And he said, well, this is the closest that one of my players have been to you in, uh, you know, in uh, the last six months because there was nobody who was within 10 yards of you all night that night. Before the Seminoles and Penn State met in the 1967 Gator Bowl, Nittany Lions coach Joe Paterno called Florida State the best passing team he had ever seen. Sheer flattery in the eyes of many, especially after Penn State raced to a 17-0 halftime lead. It looked kind of dismal, you know, for us, but, uh, you know, we went in together and the coaching staff said we can win this ball game. Coach Pete gave us one of his little talks at halftime and told us guys we just need to bear down and, and grit our teeth and go out there and play the ball that we were used to playing. Early in the second half, momentum began to shift on one single play. Still in front by 17, Penn State faced fourth and short from its own 15-yard line. Paterno made the surprising decision to go for it, and when his team failed to convert, the Tribe would gain momentum for the rest of the contest. Quarterback Kim Hammond hit Ron Sellers for the first Seminole TD, and a Nittany Lion fumble provided another chance soon after. The Tribe quickly cashed in and trailed now by only three points. With less than 30 seconds remaining and fourth and goal at the Penn State 8, FSU tied the game on a Mark Guthrie field goal. It was a remarkable comeback against a nationally known opponent and coach. The Seminoles finished 1967 ranked number four nationally by Sports Illustrated following a 7-2-2 campaign. While in certain areas FSU seemed short in talent, Never did the Seminoles lack at quarterback during Peterson's time. The late 60s were no exception, as three promising signal callers graced the campus. Bill Kappelman, Kim Hammond, and Gary Padgett took turns lighting up the Seminole skyline, with most of their tosses going to celebrated wide receiver Ron Sellers. Ron Sellers was the most prolific receiver in Florida State history and among the most productive in NCAA annals. In fact, Jingle Joints held most of the national receiving records from the end of his senior season in 1968 until 1987. They said I was kind of elusive a little bit, but I was bow-legged as they come. And a matter of fact, Floyd Little is probably the only guy, football player, who has bow legs worse than mine. So he just said I could walk over a fire hydrant uh, without having to jump over it. And uh, so then, because I was so skinny, and uh, they just started calling me Jingle Joints. From 1966 to 1968, Sellers accumulated 3,598 yards and 23 scores on 212 receptions. He caught passes in 30 straight games averaging 119.9 yards per game. A member of the College Football Hall of Fame, Sellers' graceful stride and sure hands made him one of the game's all-time greats. I ran uh, inaccurate routes, but I could catch a football, and after I caught it, um, I was pretty good at running with the ball uh, after I caught the ball. Sellers, I think, is one of the great receivers of all time. I, uh... The guy would go across the middle. He had great speed. He was a great kid to coach. A great attitude, you know. And uh, so he was a great, great kid. When Bill Peterson arrived at FSU, Seminole football was floundering. 
he left the school with one of the most heralded offensive machines of the decade and legends and lore of plenty. Jingle Joints, Bolitnikov, The Seven Magnificents, The Alabama Tie, and so much more. His slips of the tongue may have captured the public's fancy, but Peterson's legacy was far more significant. He was as instrumental in putting FSU on the college football map as any other person.